Okay then, well, hello. Hello everybody. Welcome to the, the penultimate session in this semester's series on the ocean. That means there's just one left. And <laughs> having spent uh, a lot of our time thinking about the aesthetic and evocative appeal of the ocean, we turn today to a consideration of the threats it faces, principally the effects on the ocean of climate change and global warming. And to guide us through this subject, we have assembled an impressive panel of experts who will share their thoughts and their research findings with us. And I'm gonna introduce them in alphabetical order. Uh, Hugh Ellis received his PhD in zoology from the University of Florida, Gainesville and arrived at USD in 1980. He is professor in the Department of Biology and his principal area of research is in the energetics of birds. Dr. Ellis has been a visiting research scientist at the University of Hawaii, Sydney University in Australia and the Archbold Biological Station in Florida. Among his recent projects in the field of physiological ecology, he's been working in Svalbard in the high Arctic on and off since 2012 on kittiwakes and Arctic terns, looking at the intersection between energy use, costs of migration, and the effects of pollution. Kawa Tran joined USD at the beginning of this semester, and this very happily marks her return to San Diego since she grew up in the City Heights neighborhood of our city. She previously taught at Cal State Chico, and is now assistant professor in the Department of Biology here at USD. Dr. Tran received her PhD again in zoology from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and her research centers on marine symbiosis, in particular, the symbiotic relationships among a range of biological organisms, such as sea anemones, coral, and algae, and the way in which climate change imperils, among other things, the health of coral reefs. Our third panelist, Ellen Wilson Norton, sorry, I'll start that again. <laughs> Ellen Willis Norton received her PhD earlier this year from UC Santa Cruz and is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Environmental Markets Lab at UC Santa Barbara. Her research focuses on how West Coast marine ecosystems are responding to climate change and the potential impact of offshore renewable energy for West Coast fished species and fisheries. Dr. Willis Norton's work on climate change and species vulnerability has appeared in such journals as Scientific Reports and Nature, Ecology and Evolution. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today and please welcome Dr. Ellis, Dr. Tran, Dr. Willis Norton. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so it is my pleasure to be here today to talk about climate change and coral reefs. All right. So I'm not sure this is on. So I want to begin by by sharing this quote from a really well known Korean American poet, Ishil Yi Park. So she says here about her writing: When I want to, when I want my writing to flow freely. I go to the water, I go to the sea, I dive deep, search coral, float, ohm, purify, cleanse, let go, pray, give thanks, and release all that does not serve me. So the beauty of the ocean and the beauty of corals and coral reefs has this intrinsic nature to draw us in as human beings. And as artists, such as Ishil Yu Park here, they can appreciate something like that. And in fact, the imagery of the ocean of coral reefs makes its way a lot into her poems, which I tend to appreciate a lot because I actually do write poetry on the side, um, besides doing science. And uh, what I especially appreciate is one of her poems, she describes that uh, there are these amazing Korean women who live off the island of Jeju, uh, off the coast of South Korea, and they have died for generations to go to the bottom of these car weeks, collect different types of seafood and bring them home to their families and to their island communities. 
So, not sure why the advancer isn't working here. Oops. So, coral reefs essentially uh, have an enormous impact in our lives and in the impact of uh, it, and impacting many different types of marine life both animals and plants that call this place home. And so coral reefs can be considered rainforests of the sea. And besides animals, one billion people rely on coral reefs as well. One billion people around the world. And I'd like you to take a moment to just kind of think about that and reflect on exactly the impact that coral reefs have in our society. But to get you to care about coral reefs, let's talk about why they're important first. Why should we care? Why should we care about coral reefs? There are actually several different things that coral reefs contribute, and among them, I've already alluded to biodiversity. Okay, so it's home to millions, and in fact, it supports 25% marine life. And so, in other words, 25% of marine life is associated with coral reefs and all this ecosystem, this important ecosystem they're home. Coastal uh, coastline protection. So these corals essentially build up to these massive, uh, massive uh, structures here that essentially act as barriers against storms, against currents, and protecting the coastline against erosion. So there's this aspect of coral reefs to consider as well. When we think about the protection of uh, homes um, and communities along the coastline. Biomedical research. My pre-med students love it when I say this part, as far as um, showing them the relevance of coral reefs. Why should you care about coral reefs as medical students? Um, they contribute to, um, to, to biomedical research in that uh, many anti-malarial and anti-cancer compounds are currently being derived from different species of corals and sponges that live within the reef. Food, coral reefs are the source of food. Um, our fisheries um, depend on coral reefs here. Now we have an expert who will talk next after me to expand on this more, so I'm not going to steal Ellen's thunder here <laughs> in talking about food and fisheries. Um, finally, tourism. So they're beautiful structures and uh, activities such as snorkeling and diving and fishing all contribute to the economy of island nations. So Therefore, tourism is another, is another reason why you should care about coral reefs, um, especially those island communities who depend on them um, for their economical uh, survival. So if you are to consider all of these different factors and you try to tag this with a monetary value, how much do you think coral reefs are worth? Hundreds? Trillions? 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 Okay. So, so, so I think I think most people can can think it's it's on the high end, right? Can come up that it's on the high high end. And in fact, coral reefs altogether, three point four billion dollar value per year. Okay, per year. So annually, if you consider all of these different aspects that coral reefs uh, uh, contribute to, this brings us to a total of three point four billion dollars uh, per year. So coral reefs have enormous value. And unfortunately, they are susceptible to mass bleaching events like you see here, um, where bleaching events can actually kill off corals within a given ecosystem like this. And so animals that depend on this uh, place um, for home, for food, losing, end up losing that resource. And in fact, in um, the, our most recent time, the most um, prolonged and probably devastating um, bleaching event would be between 2014 and 2017, where 75% of coral reefs globally have been impacted by mass bleaching events like this. So what causes coral bleaching? There are actually several different things. Rising ocean temperatures associated with global climate change, right? That can cause heat stress to the coral animal and the symbionts that live within them that I'm going to talk more about in just a little bit. Pollution is another, is another cause of coral bleaching. Um, our carbon input um, 
And also there are recent studies that suggest that um, certain sunscreens um, with certain chemicals like oxybenzone seeping into the ocean can also cause coral bleaching and cause damage to coral DNA. And finally, agricultural runoff. Um, so the introduction of herbicides that are commonly used to treat crops end up seeping into the ocean and into the coral reefs and thereby causing coral bleaching as well. So altogether, if we were to collectively talk about these things, causes of coral bleaching can um, come from a combination of global climate change and anthropogenic factors. So human-induced activities that uh, we contribute to as well. Now, to begin to unravel this coral bleaching issue and try to come up with a solution, we have to first understand uh, the, this critical symbiosis that occurs within the coral. And corals are animals, and they have essentially these single-celled algae that live within them that give them these bright, vibrant colors that you see here. So they belong to this phylum called Nidaria, and this phylum contains not just corals, but sea anemones and jellyfish as well. So if you look at something like this on the right-hand side, for example, you see this large framework, and that large framework is necessary um, to uh, provide structural and nutritional support to the entire reef ecosystem, right? Um, and you may look at this and think like it's a rock, or you might call it live rock, but it is in fact an, an animal. If we are to zoom in on, let's say, a fragment of coral and take a look at the skeleton, at the skeleton that you see here, the, the, there are these little holes inside of the skeleton, and within each little hole, there's an animal. Because if you are to zoom in on that, here's the animal right here, right? So I'm not sure if laser pointer doesn't seem to be showing on my end here. Uh, so uh, this is what we call a polyp. And so a coral is essentially not just a single animal. It's a colony of many different polyps coming together. And hence why we call these colonial polyps. Now, if you are to compare that structure that you see here to the left, and I bring in another player to the far left here, this is a sea anemone. So there are some similarities between the two. Um, so here we're looking at a coral polyp, here we're looking at a sea anemone polyp, and that you have a mouth in the center, and that mouth is surrounded by tentacles. And therefore, the sea anemone is a distant cousin of this coral. And this is going to have relevance to what I'm going to talk about later when I uh, mention what I do with these sea anemones exactly. Okay, so um, corals are animals. They have this association, the symbiotic relationship with single celled algae called dinoflagellates. And so if we are to zoom in on the anatomy of um, a coral polyp or a sea anemone polyp, this is what you might see. They have two tissue layers. Um, a, uh, an outer tissue layer called the epiderm and an inner tissue layer called the gastroderm, which essentially lines their gastric cavity. So it lines the gut. Um, and if you are to zoom in further and go into that gastroderm, that's where those dinoflagellates, those single cell algae dwell. And these algae photosynthesize. They provide their photosynthetic products, mainly in the form of glucose, to the cnidarian host, whether that be the coral or the sea anemone. And in turn, the coral or the sea anemone provide the dinoflagellates with inorganic nutrients and a home. So if you imagine these single-celled algae are just swimming out in the ocean, in the broad ocean, they can be preyed upon um, by lots of different types of predators within the ocean. But being enclosed, in a space where they get nutrition and they're able to grow and divide within a host cell, that's pretty interesting. And so this symbiosis is a mutualism where both partners benefit from each other. If we are to take a cross section and look at a, a section of a tentacle, right? Look at a section of a tentacle of this animal, this is what you might see. The epidermal layer lining the outside, and the gastrodermal layer lining the inside. And these dinoflagellates, those single-celled algae, are just within the gastroderm. 
So now understanding um, that this symbiosis um, is, uh, exists in corals and that it is critical to coral health, this is why something like this can be really devastating. So when we talk about uh, coral bleaching, we're essentially talking about that symbiosis breaking down. And especially factors like rising ocean temperatures that uh, causes heat stress to the animal, that heat stress <laughs> is going to cause that coral to essentially kick out its algal symbionts. And when those algae get expelled, what gets left behind is that transparent tissue of the animal, of the coral, exposing essentially that white calcareous skeleton right behind it. And so that's what you see here, and that's what we term coral bleaching. So while we have this attempt to save coral reefs, they are less tractable for laboratory studies in that they can grow to inconvenient sizes, if you compare this to a diver here, and uh, they are slow growing. So um, it can take many, 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 many years for um, a coral to grow to a size like that. They're difficult to maintain under laboratory conditions. They also have this hard calcareous skeleton, which would be nice if you're studying something like skeletogenesis. But if you are trying to get into the animal tissues for microscopy, for cell biology, for molecular biology, that skeleton can make it technically difficult. And finally, there are restrictions on sampling. Um, in that you can't just go out to the field and collect corals, you actually need a state issued permit to do so. And that is why we have this model, this tropical, the small tropical sea anemone called Exaptasia diaphana, commonly known as Aptasia. And uh, in the last decade, this has been de developed as the model system for studying corals and coral bleaching. So this is a time-lapse video here where you see um, an anemone polyp uh, essentially taking a little brine shrimp and putting them, grabbing it with, grabbing it with its tentacles and putting it into its mouth and in it goes um, into that gastric cavity where it gets digested. So um, these days, uh, this model was developed in 2008 from a small group of four, um, four researchers and um, now we're in 2022, and there are now multiple groups around the world adopting this model system to study coral symbiosis. And the reason why is because it's really hardy. It can reproduce like crazy in the lab. Um, and in fact, um, if you ever keep an aquarium tank and you have this guy enter, <laughs> they can certainly take over the tank because they grow and they reproduce really, really quickly, both sexually and asexually. And um, they also have the symbiotic relationship with those algae. And they appear as these brown spots that you might be able to see lining the tentacles along with stock over here. So um, they have that in common with the corals as well, where they share the symbiotic relationship um, with the algae. Moreover, in the lab, I can keep them in two different forms here. So um, I can keep these Aptasia in the symbiotic form where it's brown because it has the algae intact. I can also keep the Aptasia in this aposymbiotic form um, in the far right here, uh, where it's white because the algae are absent. And I can actually grow the algae in flasks, in culture, outside of the animal and reintroduce them back into the animal to study colonization, how these algae initially colonized the animal to begin with. So it's useful to keep these two forms around because it's analogous to a healthy and a bleached reef, respectively, these two forms, where I can study how the symbiosis is initially established and how that symbiosis also breaks down in response to something like heat stress. So to get back to coral reefs, um, as I'm continuing my studies with Aptasia, um, I want this to apply to coral reef and coral reef conservation. And there are many strategies in place that are currently being developed to tackle this problem and to tackle coral reef conservation. And uh, we, we want to ask how might we be able to help corals acclimate to global climate change? We're not going to be able to stop global climate change. Um, but how can we help these corals better survive, better acclimate and adapt to rising ocean temperatures? 
And while there are many strategies out there from transplantation of corals to gradually warmer waters, um, all the way to growing certain thermal tolerant species of corals in coral nurseries, the strategy that I want to focus on that is related to my work is actually to harness the power of microbes, um, where corals and sea anemones also associate with bacteria. So I talked about their symbiotic relationship with algae, but there's this third partner um, in this relationship where you have the corals or the sea anemones, the algae, and then the bacteria as well. So there are bacteria all over the place um, represented within the animal. Um, and within all of the tissue layers that, uh, that are present within the animal. And we want to ask this question, can these bacteria be developed into probiotics to help corals acclimate to heat stress? And so this word probiotics is something that you may have come across before. Um, you could purchase uh, probiotics from the store, consume it, and it's supposed to provide you with digestive health, uh, digestive benefits, because it changes your gut microbiome, right? It shifts the bacterial community within your gut. And it's the same concept here where scientists are trying to develop marine probiotics to benefit corals. Where let's say we can go out and isolate and culture a diversity of microbes from corals and different coral species. And we can identify the beneficial ones, right? Ones that contribute to host physiology, ones that could potentially increase it's thermal tolerance, and we create a probiotic inoculum, okay, as a result of those beneficial microbes, and then we go back and inoculate corals to enhance their performance, right? So um, giving, giving corals marine probiotics to help them deal with climate change and specifically rising ocean temperatures. Now, I'm in the camp where let's not rush and go out and mess with nature and manipulate the coral microbiome right away. I think that there is a necessity to test the effectiveness of these probiotics in a laboratory model like Actasia first, right? Not to mention there are lots of interesting basic science questions that we still have to ask. Like, how do these bacteria get into the animal to begin with? Um, and uh, how, what's the time period that the symbiosis would last? Because if we want a helpful probiotic, it needs to be something that can have a long-term association with the host. So these are some foundational questions we still have to figure out. And I believe we can do that with a model like Aptasia prior to going out to, to mess with nature and to mess with coral bi microbiome um, out in the field. Now, what I do in my lab is essentially um, host microbe interactions looking at this from a molecular and cellular perspective and um, how these mechanisms mediate an ecologically important symbiosis between the cnidarian host, the associated bacteria, and the associated algae. And this is in the context of a changing environment. And so to do this, we have to integrate these different subdisciplines of biology, such as microbiology, cell and molecular biology, and physiology. And uh, that's what I do in my lab with undergraduate researchers. But I would also argue that to save coral reefs and taking a holistic perspective, we have to also integrate this interdisciplinary approach where we also look beyond biology and beyond the natural sciences and incorporate the social sciences and the humanities. Because after all, we've already established that coral reefs have enormous ecological, economic, and aesthetic value. And so we have to integrate multiple disciplines to sustain our coral reefs, our environment, our planet, and global climate change and its effect on coral reefs, this important ecosystem, is one of the most urgent challenges of our time right now. And while I'm working on this global issue, it's also a personal one. And I'd like to offer and close with that kind of perspective, like from a place of being a human being where my love for the ocean started as a kid. I'm pictured here with my younger brother at La Jolla Cove. I grew up in an underserved neighborhood of City Heights in San Diego, where um, despite the ocean being so close, it was never something that we frequented because my parents were working all the time. 
And when my mom could take us to the beach and we would take the city bus all the way from City Heights to La Jolla, um, we would really cherish this moment. And uh, that love for the ocean um, continued to expand. And I really didn't see my coral, my first coral reef until I was an undergraduate student, um, a senior participating in this class um, on the island of Morea in French Polynesia. And so uh, that experience was something that I would never forget that uh, in snorkeling in those pristine waters and being surrounded by these massive corals, I can really, really appreciate um, how, how, how old, first of all, those coral reefs were. And um, you start to think about the history, the geomorphology of these massive, beautiful structures and the amount of life it sustained. And so there's this elation and there's, there's this interconnectedness that you get um, when it comes to being surrounded in that type of ecosystem. And uh, it's the stuff that poets write about, um, which is why I began with that quote from the poet um, to begin with. And um, here is where I also um, had my first taste of undergraduate research. Um, and so I was part of this class and I'm the one in the red there in the middle. And uh, this really launched the rest of my career. And so I'd like to implore you to think about what can we do? What can you do? It may not be like the grandest things in the world. And certainly I'm not out there um, working in the water every day and, um, and, and, uh, and doing you know, some, something, something big like publishing multiple papers um, in this field right now. But um, my small thing I think is that I can pass this on to the next generation of biologists. In um, training and mentoring students um, like Madison Gutierrez up here um, to present this kind of stuff at scientific conferences and to see them through graduation, um, to go out into the real world and to try to make it a better place. Because after all, um, besides being a professor and being a scientist, I'm first and foremost a mother, mm -hmm. a wife, a daughter, and a sister. And um, I want to leave this planet a better place for our children and our grandchildren. So thank you very much. I can just start the I'll say. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ellen. I'm going to be talking about impacts of climate change on the California market squid fishery. It's coming up. Um, <laughs> I'll just say before I get started, here we go, um, that I do this work with a bunch of people, um, Carrie Pomeroy, Nere Lizamo Ochoa, Justin Suka. So it's not Elliot Hazen. Who's, uh, so it's not just me working on this. Um, hopefully, let's see. Perfect. Okay, so I haven't been to these talks um, since I'm not around here, but I have heard that you've been studying and thinking about the various ways that the ocean touches human life and our imagination. And so one of the most important parts of this connection and the reason I think that we are lured to the sea is because the ocean sustains us. The ocean has been fished for thousands of years and it is an integral part of human society and that's because it's our food. So as of now, um, fish species are 20% of worldwide protein consumption. But the UN has said that if we want to deal with the issue of the world population growing and climate change, we're gonna have to get more food from the ocean. And this is all while the ocean is getting warmer, there's less oxygen, it's becoming more acidic. So that's a conundrum. Um, Okay, so I study California and California fish species and how they're gonna be affected by climate change. Um, that's because we're from here, we live here, um, it's important to us. Uh, it also is a place where fisheries have a very long history that have been supporting the livelihoods, the economics and the culture of the region. Um, so we know that subsistence fishing, like salmon fishing, has been going on for a really long time. Uh, this is the earliest picture I can find, Native Americans fishing in, I think, the 1860s uh, um, in Northern California. We have the wet fish fishery in Monterey Bay um, that 
uh, Chinese immigrants founded in 1851, and that was the start of industrial saltwater fishing in California. Um, and when I say wet fish, it means sardine, anchovy, mackerel, squid. Um, and we know that that has captured our imagination. One of the most famous American novelists um, has really focused on this area and this fishery. And then in San Diego. Um, so in San Diego in the early 1900s and mid 1900s, the tuna fishery was huge. It was actually the third largest industry um, right below the Navy and aerospace. And it started to move north, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> um, and right now, um, so yeah, I'll just say that it is very quintessential California. California fisheries are a big part of our cultural identity. Um, but not only that, um, it's also very important economically. So right now, California commercial fisheries, they support about 10,000 jobs and a $1.5 billion industry per year. And today I'm going to be talking about market squid um, because it's a case study of how California fisheries may be impacted by climate change because it's ranked as the top fishery in California for both pounds landed and the value. So its demise would be very significant. And it's also interesting, it's a very short-lived species. They only live about six to nine months. And so when you have a short-lived species, it means that they're very uh, tightly tied to the environmental conditions. When you have a longer lived species, it means they can kind of weather bad years, not so much with a short lived species. Also, it has this very long history in California. So the species was first fished by Chinese vessels in the 1860s in Monterey. Uh, in 1985, landings in Southern California overtook those in Monterey. And then in the mid 1990s, that's when market squid became the largest fishery in California, and it remains that to this day. Um, some other interesting facts about the fishery, it um, acts as a day trip fishery. And what I mean by that is that vessels go out each night and then they come back in the morning. Um, if you ever see these really bright lights out on the water, you're probably looking at a squid vessel. Um, they use these incandescent lights to attract the squid to the surface and to concentrate them and they scoop them up. You often see these little light boats that are working alongside the actual vessel and those light boats are just used to get more lights onto the water. Um, and the reason it's important it's a day trip fishery is because these fishermen are very tightly tied to their community. They're not going out for days, weeks, months at a time and going traveling really far. Every single day, they're coming back home to their family, back home to their community. And so they're not traveling very far. Um, some other fun things on um, this vessel that you see on the left here, um, there's two different ways that people um, fish market squid. The first way is this larger vessel is called um, a saner, it's also round hull gear. Basically, this is what it looks under the water. That's why it's called round hull. Um, these vessels are larger than the other type of vessel that is used to fish market squid. And that is what we call a braille vessel. And that's just this scoop net gear. So they're often these smaller vessels. They're literally just scooping squid out of the water. So those are the two main types of vessels. Okay. So I've been using the word fishery, um, and I just want to talk to you a bit about what is a fishery, because a fishery is not just the actual fish species and the fishermen. It includes the labor, the facilities at the landing port. So I'm talking about the people that are working the ice machines, the people that are working the fuel dock, that are using the weigh bins, that are using the pumps to get the fish off of the boat onto the dock, the buyers that are ready for the fish to be received at the dock and purchase it, the truckers that are there to then transport the squid to the processing facility, and the people that are actually processing the catch and exporting it. Um, so the reason I say this is because it forms this very complex social network. And a lot of these relationships are built on loyalty and trust that have built over years. Okay. Um, and the issue with these very complex social networks, these communities, is that these are all food producing communities. So they're very vulnerable to environmental changes. And boy, do we have the biggest environmental change that we have experienced yet. Uh, so we're dealing with a warmer ocean that has less oxygen, that is more acidic. And so species are on the move. 
Um, sometimes that means literally like actually species are moving the majority of the time. That just means that survival is now lower in the place where they used to be. And it's higher um, in historically cooler places that now have their preferred temperature. Um, this is just, this figure is just showing an example of what we've seen in the United States. So on the x-axis you have years and then you have average distance move. So um, whole word is going up. And so you see the blue line is the northeast of the US. Um, and so you see that there's been a poleward shift. Um, the green is the Eastern Bering Sea, which is in Alaska. There's also been a poleward shift. So things are moving. And the human community can respond to these shifts in multiple ways. So I'll go through each one. There's four different ways. So the first one is they can cope without changing their behavior. So just because the availability of a species goes down, it doesn't mean that fishery participants are going to change their behavior. So as I mentioned before, there's all these different types of fishery participants that are tightly tied to their community. Uh, and it's also their personal identity. A lot of the, it's a hard job. It's very, very hard. And so people aren't in it just for the money. They're in it because this is who they are. They are fishermen. Um, and so they, people just weather bad years. Um, the second thing that could happen is they could shift their fishing location. Um, if you shift your fishing location, it could potentially reorganize your social network. So say that you end up landing your catch. Landing just means that you are landing at a particular port and you're unloading and selling your catch. So if you're landing your catch at a northern port, but your buyer is in Southern California, are you going to still sell that buyer or are you going to sell to another buyer? You could also shift your target species which just means that you're gonna stay in the same location you fished before and just fish a new species, or you could exit fishing altogether. For squid, um, this was a paper that just came out this year, that for fishermen that were 60% of their income is coming from fishing squid, they would rather exit fishing altogether than shift to a new target species. Okay, so before I jump into how are the actual fishery participants responding to climate change, we really know, want to know how are market squid gonna respond? So I created a model that projected suitable habitat for squid in the future. And I found that market squid's preferred habitat, it will shift with climate change. Um, so this figure on the left, uh, we're looking at habitat suitability. I'll just orient you here. So purple, uh, cooler colors means less suitable habitat. Warmer colors means more suitable habitat. And so this is from 1985 to 2015 on the left, a little small for those in the back, but you can see that the most suitable habitat is right here in Southern California. And as you go farther north, all the way to the Canadian border, you get less suitable habitat. By 2070 to 2100, you can see there's still suitable habitat in, in um, Southern California. We're not at the purple, but the most suitable habitat is now around the Bay Area. And so this figure just um, shows this in a different way, basically just reinforces the point that this is a latitudinal shift on your y-axis in time, on your x. Don't worry about the different lines, they're just different climate model results. But basically it's showing we're seeing this poleward shift, and by 2100 we project that the center of squids distribution is going to be between San Francisco and Eureka, California. So now that we know that the best habitat for market squid will shift poleward, how can we determine how the market squid fishery will respond to this projected shift? The nice thing about where we are is we've got this very significant variability in oceanographic conditions already along California's coast, because every two to seven years, there's this thing called El Nino and La Nina events. So El Nino years, you all might know it because it's a really good snow year during El Nino, uh, but in the ocean, it usually means that there's warmer conditions and lower productivity, such as means less food um, for species to eat. La Nina years are usually cooler and there's more food. And so El Nino events are often used as a proxy for what may happen with climate change because they mimic what we see with this warming condition. And so what I did was I looked at how squid fishery participants responded to the 2015 through 2016 El Nino, which was the strongest, most recent El Nino, which 
Kawa said, 2014 to 2017 was a really crazy time period for the ocean um, in many different ways. Um, 2010 through 2011, La Nina was the most recent um, strong La Nina. And then I just looked at a neutral period, which was 2012 to 2013. So my overarching question was, how did markets good participants respond to warming? So does the number of participating vessels drop during the El Nino period? Is there a difference between the saner vessels, those larger vessels, and the braille vessels, those scoop net vessels? Or do they respond in the same way? Do vessels show fidelity to ports? So are they always landing in the same port no matter what? Or are they moving north and are they landing in different ports? And then finally, do vessels sell to the same buyers in different environmental conditions? Or is this loyalty between vessel and buyer continue no matter what? Okay, so I'm gonna go through my methods, just a little um, a brief introduction to a network analysis so you guys can understand my figures coming up. Uh, this is just an example of a network, basically, a larger circle is a port and a square is a vessel. If it's blue, it means it's a Northern California port. So that means anything above Point Conception, so Santa Barbara. And then red is anything below Point Conception, and that's considered a Southern California port. So in this network, what you're seeing is you've got this Northern California vessel. It's only selling, it's, it's only landing its catch in a Northern California port. But this red Southern California vessel is landing catch in both a Northern California and Southern California port. But because the thickness of the line is greater, it means they're landing more often in Southern California. But say the conditions change, potentially we could see that that Southern California port disappears and that Southern California vessel is moved up north and is only landing its catch up north. Okay, so that's just a little sneak peek before I just wanna show you what actually happened. Um, to just straight pounds landed of market squid. So here's what we see. Um, we see total pounds landed on the y-axis in year. Um, we have data from 2005 to 2021. You can see that there was a, a high of pounds landed during the La Nina, and then the pounds landed dropped precipitously during 2015 through 2016. Um, and it has never recovered to this day. Um, this figure is just showing um, so you got proportion of total squid catch. Um, so basically the proportion that's being landed in Southern California ports in the coral and the proportion of squid catch is being landed in Northern California ports in blue. All I really wanna show you is that since 2009, we've seen a steady increase in the proportion of squid catch that is being landed in the North. And just as a reminder, that is really important because the center of the fishery, the community is right now in Southern California. So let's take a look at what happened with the actual network. Now that we see that potentially there's not less squid, but the squid are further north. Okay, so this is the first network analysis. This is for braille fishermen. So those smaller boats using those scoop nets. Um, what I found is that during the 2010 through 2011 La Nina, the central port is San Pedro, so that's in the Los Angeles area. And there's a lot of vessels participating. They're mainly landing at San Pedro. There's thicker lines, which means they're landing a lot of times. Uh, port Wyoming and Terminal Island are also important. If you move and look at the 2015 through 2016 El Nino period, you see that the thickness of the lines they're just not landing very much and fewer vessels are participating. So people did exit the fishery. Braille fishermen exited the fishery during the El Nino period. And you are not seeing any blue circles and a blue circle means a Northern California port. So even during an El Nino period, Braille fishermen are not moving North and they are staying where their community is. But, oops. Oh, no, hold on. There we go. Okay, so here's saner fishermen, so those larger vessels. Um, you can see that they, well, I will explain to you that they are potentially adapting to changing environmental conditions. So if you look at the La Nina period, you see there's four central ports mainly, um, maybe a bit more. So the um, four Southern California ports and then a couple Northern California ports, Monterey and Moss Landing, which are always big squid zones. Um, but 
Basically, there's only four Northern California ports during the La Nina. When you move to the El Nino period, there are seven Northern California ports here, and there are a lot more connections. So vessels are landing a, a lot more often at those Northern California ports. And the thing that's like really hard to see, so I'll just tell you, uh, is that I found that if you look at all of the little vessel lines in the La Nina period, they're usually only connected to one port. So they are landing in one port every single time. So that probably means they're just landing in their community Every day they go out, every day they come back to the same port. During the El Nino, vessels had connections to at least 86% of vessels had connections to at least two to three ports. And so to me, that says that they are adapting to this changing environmental condition. They're willing to move farther north and they're also willing to land in more ports. So let's move on. I'm gonna... Um, show you vessel buyer relationships. I'm not gonna subject you to the same network analysis figures because they can be a little ugly. So I'll just tell you my results. What I found is that 68% of vessels are selling catch to the same buyers no matter the environmental conditions. So basically there's a lot of loyalty going on between these vessels and buyers. So that means if you have a vessel that is going up and landing catch in Eureka, they are continuing to purchase from Southern California processors who are trucking from that Northern California port all the way down to Southern California. I did find though that the smaller Southern California buyers didn't purchase squid during the El Nino period, only the larger ones did. So that could say that the smaller, smaller Southern California buyers are the losers in this situation compared to the larger processors and buyers. And then finally, what I thought was really interesting and it's unexpected for me was that northern california buyers the amount of catch they purchased didn't differ between the two environmental periods so that could mean two things it could mean that we've got this loyalty and this reciprocity going on between vessels and buyers and so no matter the environmental conditions you're still going to sell to a southern california buyer or it could mean that northern california buyers and processors don't have the capability to handle more squid. So even if there's more available where they are, they just don't have the facilities to handle it. So my conclusions are, is that yes, the market squid fishery shows vulnerability to climate change. We did show how pounds landed dropped during that El Nino period, but, we found that saner vessels did not drop out of the fishery. We saw them adapt to these changing conditions. And so that could mean that these small vessel owners and operators in the market squid fishing fleet may re be replaced by these larger vessels. So we're seeing different, different adaptabilities of these different fishery participants. And then finally, we found that vessel buyer relationships may endure despite a change in fishing location. And so if that means that they are landing catch up north, these ports up north are often a lot smaller and there's a lot more safety risks. A lot of the Southern California ports are bigger and there's less of a safety issue. So what we need to do is we need to be building up that infrastructure to handle the increased catch and then also the trucking routes. There's serious issues from getting squid all the way up from Northern California to Southern California. The roads are pretty dangerous for large trucks. Um, and then I want to make one last point. We've been talking about a uh, two two year period. So this 2010 through 2011 period and this 2015 through 2016 period. And we're looking at how the fishing community responded as a potential proxy for what might happen in the future. But we don't know how the community will respond to a much longer term change. When we're looking at market squid in the future, we're looking at about out about 2070, 2100. So how they may respond may be different, but hopefully studies like this can help us prepare for what could happen so they can adapt and be ready. And so I just wanna end with saying, this is just one case study. The reason I chose it is because it is California's most valuable fishery at the moment. And the reason it's important to do these types of studies for more fisheries is that we need to prepare for climate change and for what's to come. So we can sustain our relationship to the ocean, our food supply. And so that means that we probably need 
state and federal governments to implement new management approaches. Because right now, especially let's talk about the United States, um, but this is true in a lot of countries, fisheries management is really based on this very stable relationship between this is the abundance of a fish species. And so this is, means how much is gonna grow in the next year. And climate variation is just this noise around that pattern. And that's not what's gonna happen with climate change. Climate change is not a noise around a pattern. It's a very significant long-term trend. And so our normal fisheries management strategies might not be enough. And so that's why we've been talking about something new, this thing called climate ready fisheries management. So it's this adaptive and responsive management strategy that allows fishery systems to cope more adeptly with climate impacts across a broad spectrum of timescales. And the only way you can do climate ready fisheries management is you, you need to have enough information. So these type of vulnerability studies are important to have the information. But let's tell you what I think needs to happen. I think that we need transparent and inclusive decision-making processes. So the actual fishing community needs to be in charge of what type of management do they want. Do they want a territorial right to a certain area? Do they want just a simple catch quota? What is gonna be best for them in a changing environment? We also need to encourage the diversification of target species. So say that you're catching squid, um, and squid are very responsive to warmer temperatures, you also should have in your portfolio of what you're catching, a species that is not as responsive to these warmer temperatures. So you have something to, to catch and to make income on um, when the squid are gone. Um, we also, in the same vein, need to really support flexibility. Sometimes the way our permitting system works right now, um, there's not, it's not easy to switch between different fisheries. And then finally, we really need to consider the entire social ecological system. We need to consider, like I talked about, the truckers, the buyers, the processors, not just the fishermen and, the fi and this one fish species. We need to consider the entire community, which includes the ecological community. That's it. Okay. There were two versions. I found a... Uh, um, few mistakes in the original one that I had put together, and I assumed that Ron Kelson would be here, and I knew Ron would catch those mistakes right away. <laughs> so I had to do some quick rewriting this afternoon, and we'll see, maybe this is the right one. I want to talk about the Arctic. Uh, I, as uh, Brian mentioned, I've spent parts of the last 10 years in the Arctic, in the high Arctic, and I've spent, as a result, some amount of time in Scandinavia, and it turns out that there's this extraordinary set of challenges. We're all aware of uh, sea level rise, we're all worried about it, and I want to introduce to you the fact that there is also such a thing as land level rise, and so how do these two interact? And particularly in a place which is so surrounded by the ocean. So first of all, just a little bit of background. We know that sea level is rising and it's rising because the ice is melting, because air and sea temperatures are warming, because there's this general global warming trend that we call climate change, which is driven by an increase in heat retaining gases in the atmosphere, something that we call the greenhouse effect. Now, there's nothing wrong with the greenhouse effect. If it weren't for the greenhouse effect, uh, we would be living on a frozen planet uh, in virtually all parts of the earth, except maybe the equator. And uh, the issue is that there is a fine line between uh, a greenhouse effect that keeps us where we were 30 years ago and maybe where we're headed. So uh, when we talk about these greenhouse gases, they are, oh, I can't point. Yeah, this doesn't work on this screen. You can see these greenhouse gases have been going up over the last couple of hundred years. They've been going up as uh, the Industrial Revolution has been pushing them. Carbon dioxide is the one we usually talk about, and we can see it <laughs> going up pretty rapidly as well in recent years. 
In fact, it turns out that carbon dioxide increases and decreases are pretty standard if you look at the last roughly million years. This is what we see. So increases in carbon dioxide are not new, but the size of this one really is. And so we are looking at that. And, and by the way, the numbers here are from 2016. They're higher now, uh, not surprisingly. And uh, we're looking at double the previous high, almost, well, no, not, not double, but 50% uh, higher. And the temperature changes have been rapid rapidly increasing. So in 1850, when uh, we started to notice these temperature, or at least we can go back into the records and find these temperature changes, we were looking at uh, a little more than half a degree Celsius per decade, whereas today we have uh, tripled that rate. And so the question is, how does the temperature affect sea level? Well, uh, right now, almost all of the change in sea level, and it's measurable, and people that live near the coasts are very aware of it. This is really just due to thermal expansion as water warms, and the molecules separate, and you get uh, some more sea level. Uh, we like to talk a lot about ice shelves. And, uh, and for people like me who work in the Arctic, this is really important because ecologically, it has huge impacts. Um, but it doesn't really affect sea level rise very much. Uh, first, let's look at some of those changes. So. This is sea ice in the Arctic. Uh, and to give you a sense, here is Scandinavia and uh, Canada and Alaska, and Siberia. So the North Pole's right here. Here's Greenland. And uh, if you look at where the sea ice was in 1979, you would be following this orange line here. But if you look at 2015, well, you can see where the sea ice is. And it turns out that that is a change of about a million square miles. Uh, of course, I can say that, and it's hard to imagine. What does that mean? What's a million square miles? Uh, so I thought I would tell you first what a million square miles so, are. Yeah. Uh, Argentina, um, or uh, Kazakhstan, that, that's about a million square miles, or uh, a third of the continental United States, that's about a million square. So that's the amount of sea ice we're losing. We're losing a lot of sea ice. But in fact, it doesn't really matter much in terms of sea level, because this is ice that's already in the water. The big thing is glaciers and ice sheets. We want to talk a little bit about that. And we know that glaciers and ice sheets are most prevalent near the North and the South Pole in Arctic and Antarctic areas. And it turns out that every global warming model since the probably early 1990s has shown that warming will be greatest at high latitudes. So the warming is greatest where the ice is most prevalent. Let's look at the Arctic. So when we look at the Arctic, this line is the Arctic Circle. Uh, and I have circled here 
an archipelago that we know is Svalbard. It's where I've been working for the last several years. So if you look at Svalbard, which is about halfway between the top of Norway and, and Russia to the North Pole, a few hundred miles from each. Then when you look at Svalbard, toward the north on the western shores, there is a fjord right there. It is this fjord called Kongsfjorden. And on Kongsfjorden is Nielsen, which is a research village where I work. Um, its glaciers are shrinking. And I want to really emphasize what we're dealing with. This is a photograph taken by uh, my colleague, Geir Gabrielson, who some of you know because. He did a sabbatical in my lab a few years ago. We actually watched this happen uh, from a small boat. <clears throat> this, uh, to give you perspective, is about 200 meters. So we're looking at a lot of height. I would like to show you Looking at Kongsfjorden, what, uh, what changes have occurred in the last century? Here is a picture taken looking across the fjord from the Olsen in 1918. Uh, the ice looks close. It is relatively close. It's about two miles away. But remember, it's running roughly 200 meters tall. So it looks closer than it is. But what I'd like you to appreciate is what it looked like in 2002. And uh, what it looked like recently. We are talking about a huge loss of ice in Svalbard, and we're seeing the same thing, of course, all over polar regions throughout the world. So what are we talking about here? Turns out that almost all the fresh water in the world, well, I shouldn't put it that way. Relatively speaking, most of the fresh water in the world is locked up in glaciers and ice sheets. And what would that mean? Well, as I said, for sea ice and ice shelves are already in the water, if they all melted, it'd be an ecological catastrophe, but it would only increase sea level about a foot. If the Greenland glaciers and ice sheets were to go, we're looking at about 24 feet. And Antarctica, oh, that's big. That's 190 feet. So together, I add that up to 214 feet. I checked today. How high is US? <laughs> What's 220? That gives us six. So first of all, we're commuting by boat. <laughs> and second of all, don't even get me started on team times. So, and we're not even talking about all the terrestrial glaciers which are going relatively faster. So what about land? Because that's what I want to talk about. I want to compare sea and land. Uh, so first, I, this is not so good. 
but I just want to give you something that's familiar. This is obviously North America. This is the Laurentide ice sheet of the Pleistocene. Um, it is not the only ice, <coughs> ice sheet. There's another ice sheet here, but we're just talking about this. The picture I just showed you was the furthest south it reached it was about 20,000 years ago. Um, it was between one and two miles thick. Now I don't know about you, but when I carry a block of ice, how much, where, how much does a block of ice weigh? I, I think you must know. What is a block of ice weigh that you get at Albertsons or something? Yeah, like ten pounds, ten pounds. That's the same. Once again, a mile, maybe two miles thick. And it is so heavy that it depresses the land. As the Laurentide ice sheet was starting to retreat about 10,000 years ago, 9,500 years ago, it retreats to just north of the Great Lakes. And now the weight of the ice is so heavy that the whole Great Lakes region, which is uh, looks different than it does today, it has different names than that. It takes. Water starts to spill out. So this is what it looked like then. See, all they have all these different names. Uh, here's the ice, <laughs> excuse me. And uh, the tilt, water is going toward that direction. And uh, the water is going toward this direction. And you know what this means? It means the end of Toronto and Ottawa and Montreal and Quebec City. They go just go away. It is 10,000 years before they were built. So <laughs> they were safe. But it, it gives you a sense of what we can be talking about. Now, as that ice moves north, the land starts to come back up. This is known as isostatic rebound. And we can really see it clearly in this area. So if we look at Michigan, this is Michigan. Uh, this is people. It's trying to give you a sense of scale. <laughs> This is part of Lake Michigan, and this is about 20 feet that it has come up in the last couple thousand years. This is isostatic rebound, but this is Michigan. You know, so the relationship of land and sea really means absolutely nothing so this is Scandinavia. Right, now we can talk about Scandinavia, and Scandinavia has a nice sheet. It's a Scandinavian ice sheet. It's two miles thick. It covered six over six million square kilometers. And as it retreated, more isostatic rebound. So in the 20th century alone, the land rises over 60 centimeters, which is, is about, is that right? That's not right. No, 24 inches. Ah, all right. Thank God my counsel is not here. All right. French Canadians, we do metric all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. All right. In the 21st century, 
we think it's going to rise a little bit faster. And this is going to go on for thousands of years. So I want to bring you in Scandinavia to Sweden, close to the top of the Baltic, almost to the Arctic Circle, to a town known as Lulia. Now, this sheet is in Old Lulia, a uh, town that was seabed entirely until the 15th century. But the land has been rising, and this is nowhere close to seabed. This is the port of, uh, of Lulia. And uh, well, I'm missing something, but uh, Lulia has to be constantly dredged out because the seabed is rising too with the land. And so the port can't accommodate ships if they don't constantly dredge. This is the old town of Lulia. It's not even within sight of the ocean. Recently, an old Stone Age hunter's camp was discovered that used to be right on the coast. It's now 200 kilometers inland. This is the level of land increase that isostatic rebound can cause. But it's not just Norway. And it's Sweden and it's Finland. And of course, as the land goes up, that water displaces got to go somewhere. So I think it's going mostly to the Netherlands. They're building the dikes with her. You know, the Netherlands is prepared to give up 25% of its land in the next 50 years because of sea level rise. Um, and it's not just isostatic rebound. In Scandinavia, there's something else going on. I guess you've probably heard of this other Scandinavian country called Iceland. Iceland's still building. And so there is this magma plume coming up, and it's not just coming up under Iceland, which is here. It's coming up under Norway. We think it probably is coming up under Sweden. It is coming up under Scotland. And these areas are coming up. It's not when you talk to somebody that lives in the middle of Scandinavia about sea level rise, it's got a whole different kind of meaning to them. So what's going on? In 2018, the sea level was going up about almost an inch a year, but the land was going up two and a half inches a year. So you might think you must be safe in Scandinavia, except there's this problem in the Southern Hemisphere. It's called Antarctica. It involves the West Antarctic ice sheet because we now know that that's melting faster than we thought because there is warm water underneath melting it also from below. And when this goes, we're looking at about another eight feet. Uh, now, these are conservative estimates and not everybody agrees with them, so there has been a relatively recent study by the Intergovernment Project on Climate Change that was published in Scientific American that argues that for every degree of global warming, we could look at 2.3 meters of sea level rise. Uh, let's see. So if there's two degrees warming, that's about 15 feet. There's three degrees. 
That's much more. And so now we find that sea level is rising faster than land is. Oh, the see, people in Scandinavia do need to worry about sea level rise. There are lessons in North America, unless you happen to live in Michigan. <laughs> and uh, let's talk about those just for a minute, because this is what we think the coastline might look like at the start of the next century. Let's look at it from a California perspective. You know, we're so worried about the Delta up north. We get, it comes back, but it's not to be fresh water. And oh, we, the Central Valley, that's it there. San Diego, mm, I checked, my house is safe. <laughs> Uh, I gave you this picture because, as you know, we there, there's a governor in uh, Florida that is sending people to places like New York and uh, Martha's Vineyard. That's not going to be possible. Of course, this governor has bigger problems. <laughs> because that's his state. <laughs> and that's the coastline. So this is the issue. What is it? We got sea level. We got land level. So a lot going on here. It's something we're thinking about. And that's where I'll be. Fascinating and disturbing stuff. <laughs> and then you can pick a piece of dark. Let's take one piece of dark. Thanks. Should, should the United States government and state government Plan to depopulate the seashore areas in California to Alaska, Texas, to Florida, Florida, today, and start moving people in. You know, there is a, a state plan in California. Every city is supposed to have a plan for sea level rise, every coastal city. Uh, and, and they do with, I think, the exception of Del Mar. Del Mar does not believe this is going to happen. Or, or maybe it's going to happen everywhere, except Del Mar is going to be. Uh, so there's talk about what to do, but frankly, uh, I mean, telling people that they have to leave their homes when it's 50 years away telling people that they have to leave their homes when it's 50 days away, like, or 50 minutes, uh, 50 hours away during a hurricane. It just doesn't work. So I can't tell you what we ought to do. I can tell you, as I'm sure you know, realistically, what's going to happen if anyone says that. Thank you for being here, and we'll come next week. It's our final session where we'll round everything off. And if you'd love to have as many of you as possible. So thank you for being here, and thanks so much to our panelists today. Absolutely.